Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 17. At the end of our two days' sojourn, we left Great Salt Lake City hearty and well fed and happy, physically superb, but not so very much wiser, as regards the Mormon question, than we were when we arrived, perhaps. We had a deal more information than we had before, of course, but we did not know what portion of it was reliable and what was not, for it all came from acquaintances of a day, strangers, strictly speaking. We were told, for instance, that the dreadful Mountain Meadows Massacre was the work of the Indians entirely, and that the Gentiles had meanly tried to fasten it upon the Mormons. We were told, likewise, that the Indians were to blame partly, and partly the Mormons. And we were told, likewise, and just as positively, that the Mormons were almost, if not wholly, and completely responsible for that most treacherous and pitiless butchery. We got the story in all these different shapes, but it was not till several years afterward that Mrs. Waite's book, The Mormon Prophet, came out with Judge Cradlebaugh's trial of the accused parties in it, and revealed the truth, that the latter version was the correct one, and that the Mormons were the assassins. All our information had three sides to it, and so I gave up the idea that I could settle the Mormon question in two days. Still, I have seen newspaper correspondents do it in one. I left Great Salt Lake a good deal confused as to what state of things existed there, and sometimes even questioning in my own mind whether a state of things existed there at all or not. But presently I remembered, with a lightening sense of relief, that we had learned two or three trivial things there which we could be certain of, and so the two days were not wholly lost. For instance, we had learned that we were at last in a pioneer land, in absolute and tangible reality. The high prices charged for trifles were eloquent of high freights and bewildering distances of freightage. In the East, in those days, the smallest money denomination was a penny, and it represented the smallest purchasable quantity of any commodity. West of Cincinnati, the smallest coin in use was the silver five-cent piece, and no smaller quantity of an article could be bought than five cents worth. In Overland City the lowest coin appeared to be the ten-cent piece, but in Salt Lake there did not seem to be any money in circulation smaller than a quarter, or any smaller quantity purchasable of any commodity than twenty-five cents worth. We had always been used to half-dimes and five cents worth as the minimum of financial negotiations, but in Salt Lake, if one wanted a cigar, it was a quarter. If he wanted a chalk pipe, it was a quarter. If he wanted a peach, or a candle, or a newspaper, or a shave, or a little gentile whiskey to rub on his corns to arrest indigestion and keep him from having the toothache, twenty-five cents was the price, every time. When we looked at the shot-bag of silver now and then, we seemed to be wasting our substance in riotous living. But if we referred to the expense account, we could see that we had not been doing anything of the kind. But people easily get reconciled to big money and big prices, and fond and vain of both. It is a descent to little coins and cheap prices that is hardest to bear and slowest to take hold upon one's toleration. After a month's acquaintance with the twenty-five-cent minimum, the average human being is ready to blush every time he thinks of his despicable five-cent days. How sunburnt with blushes I used to get in gaudy Nevada every time I thought of my first financial experience in Salt Lake. It was on this wise, which is a favorite expression of great authors, and a very neat one, too, but I never hear anybody say on this wise when they are talking. A young half-breed, with a complexion like a yellow jacket, asked me if I would have my shoes blacked. It was at the Salt Lake House the morning after we arrived. I said yes, and he blacked them. Then I handed him a silver five-cent piece, with the benevolent air of a person who is conferring wealth and blessedness upon poverty and suffering. The yellow jacket took it with what I judged to be suppressed emotion, and laid it reverently down in the middle of his broad palm. Then he began to contemplate it, much as a philosopher contemplates a gnat's ear in the ample field of his microscope. Several mountaineers, teamsters, stage-drivers, etc., 
drew near and dropped into the tableau, and fell to surveying the money with that attractive indifference to formality which is noticeable in the hardy pioneer. Presently the yellow jacket handed the half-dime back to me, and told me I ought to keep my money in my pocket-book instead of in my soul, and then I wouldn't get it cramped and shriveled up so. What a roar of vulgar laughter there was! I destroyed the mongrel reptile on the spot, but I smiled, and smiled all the time I was detaching his scalp, for the remark he made was good for an injun. Yes, we had learned in Salt Lake to be charged great prices without letting the inward shudder appear on the surface, for even already we had overheard and noted the tenor of conversations among drivers, conductors, and hostlers, and finally among citizens of Salt Lake, until we were well aware that these superior beings despised emigrants. We permitted no tell-tale shudders and winces in our countenances, for we wanted to seem pioneers, or Mormons, half-breeds, teamsters, stage-drivers, mountain-meadow assassins, anything in the world that the Plains and Utah respected and admired. But we were wretchedly ashamed of being emigrants, and sorry enough that we had white shirts and could not swear in the presence of ladies without looking the other way. And many a time in Nevada afterwards we had occasion to remember with humiliation that we were immigrants, and consequently a low and inferior sort of creatures. Perhaps the reader has visited Utah, Nevada, or California, even in these latter days, and while communing with himself upon the sorrowful banishment of these countries from what he considers the world, has had his wings clipped by finding that he is the one to be pitied and that there are entire populations around him ready and willing to do it for him, yea, who are complacently doing it for him already, wherever he steps his foot. Poor thing they are making fun of his hat, and the cut of his New York coat, and his conscientiousness about his grammar, and his feeble profanity, and his consumingly ludicrous ignorance of oars, shafts, tunnels, and other things which he never saw before, and never felt enough interest in to read about, and all the time that he is thinking what a sad fate it is to be exiled to that far country, that lonely land, the citizens around him are looking down on him with a blighting compassion, because he is an emigrant, instead of that proudest and blessedest creature that exists on all the earth, a forty-niner. The accustomed coach-life began again now, and by midnight it almost seemed as if we never had been out of our snuggery among the mail-sacks at all. We had made one alteration, however. We had provided enough bread, boiled ham, and hard-boiled eggs to last double the six hundred miles of staging we had still to do. And it was comfort in those succeeding days to sit up and contemplate the majestic panorama of mountains and valleys spread out below us and eat ham and hard-boiled eggs, while our spiritual natures reveled alternately in rainbows, thunderstorms, and peerless sunsets. Nothing helps scenery like ham and eggs. Ham and eggs, and after these a pipe, an old, rank, delicious pipe. Ham and eggs and scenery, a downgrade, a flying coach, a fragrant pipe, and a contented heart. These make happiness. It is what all the ages have struggled for. End of chapter 17